Hello and welcome to this policy exchange webinar on uh, the coronavirus crisis and uh, uh, what the experience in Germany could help us in the UK to, to learn. And um, uh, I'm Juliette Samuel, Senior Fellow at Policy Exchange and a columnist for The Telegraph. Um, I'm here to discuss, uh, well, to ask the questions is Jeremy Hunt, who was the UK's Health Secretary from 2012 to 2018 and Foreign Secretary from 2018 to 2019. He's currently Chairman of the uh, Health Select Committee in the UK Parliament. And he's going to be asking the questions of Jens Spahn, who is Germany's Federal Minister of Health uh, and also often spoken of as one of Angela Merkel's potential successors. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Jeremy, who's going to do a brief introduction and then start firing the questions. Oh, one thing I should mention is that if you want to ask a question, which we will come to in about half an hour, you should uh, click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen uh, to enter the queue. So uh, I'll, with that, I'll hand over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Juliet, and it's a great uh, pleasure to take part in this webinar because I served as Health Secretary at the same time as uh, Jens became a Minister for Health in Germany. And we had a very close collaboration between the UK and Germany uh, because in 2016, uh, with Jens's predecessor, uh, we set up a global ministerial summit on patient safety. Uh, we had the first one in London in 2016, um, the second one in Bonn in 2017. Uh, that work continued uh, when Jens became health minister. And we've always worked very closely with Germany on matters of global health security. In fact, I remember the first time I met Jens um, at the World Health Organization, I think we had a long conversation about global health security and Germany has always been uh, one of the countries that's been most interested to engage on health security matters. And um, of course, when it comes to patient safety, the main thing that we are focusing on is trying to reduce the amount of avoidable death and harm in our healthcare systems. And um, this is something which Germany has been spectacularly more successful than the UK in doing during the coronavirus crisis. So it is particularly a uh, good idea for Policy Exchange to, to host this. Thank you to Dean Godson uh, for organizing it, for, to Juliet Samuel for chairing it this morning. And um, I think the areas that I, I want to talk about, Jens, it seems to me there are, there are two very big areas where Germany pursued a different set of policies to the UK. Uh, that may have led to considerably fewer deaths. And I wanted just to talk about those. And then I'd like to talk about where we go from here and what we do to prepare uh, for a second wave. Uh, so the first area is to do with the test and trace approach. And the conventional view in the UK is that we followed a pandemic flu strategy, which meant that we stopped widespread community testing. In fact, we stopped it on March the 12th. Um, that meant we didn't really know where the virus was. Um, that was the right strategy to do if you were following the flu playbook. But of course, uh, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, they were following the SARS playbook. They carried on testing right the way through, isolating anyone they could find who had the disease um, to try and stop them spreading it. Germany was one of the only countries, may have been the only country in Europe, that continued mass community testing right the way through. And um, you did it in a very typical, modest German way. Uh, you didn't make a fanfare about it. And um, one of the things I wondered was, if you don't mind me asking so directly, was it by accident or was it by design? Uh, and was that one of the reasons do you think why you've had some of the very best results in Europe in terms of reducing the number of coronavirus deaths. Well, Jeremy, first of all, thank you. Uh, and to Policy Exchange for, for having me after I couldn't come to your uh, analog meeting uh, some, some weeks or months ago because uh, I, due to coronavirus, actually, I had to stay in uh, Germany. It's good to see you again, Jeremy. You already mentioned how well, actually, we work together. 
in, in, actually, in both your government's posts, you were still, as a foreign minister, very much interested in patient safety. I remember that very well when we met in London the last time. Um, and it's good to see you again and just to go on with our partnership and friendship. And I hope someone again in, uh, yeah, just one-to-one uh, -one, uh, in the analog world in London or Berlin. Um, well, Germany is often referred to, as you just did, as a good example for uh, how, do, how we get through this. So far, actually, it's still an ongoing pandemic through this pandemic. Um, and that actually, first of all, makes us humble and grateful, not overconfident, uh, because you're right. Uh, you know, afterwards you can you can make a strategy, you can always say that was a strategy and that was planned from the beginning. That's always easy to do when it work, worked uh, well and developed well. But because uh, of course some things were just were just kind of uh, done accidentally too. That's that's true. And there's a second thing, by the way, I just want to mention. Uh, at the beginning is that we were lucky because all of us actually, we were not hit uh, uh, as the first country. I remember very well the situation in North Italy uh, and we were meeting with health ministers uh, actually from the border region of North Italy, the one from Austria, Switzerland. Uh, 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 they invited uh, Germany too because there's a big interconnection between Milano and, and Munich, for example. Um, uh, and actually, back then, it was only in North Italy uh, so far, uh, but they were hard, hit very, very hard already. And of course, that gave all of us a signal, prepare. Uh, so we had the chance to prepare. Uh, and there are two or three things that actually uh, made a difference from my point of view for Germany in this. One is, and I come back to the testing, but just one uh, that is important is that we have a, a broad network of general practitioners uh, 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 that actually are all over the country, not somehow connected with the hospitals. And six of seven COVID-19 patients in Germany were treated there, the milder cases. So the hospitals were not overrun. And that made a difference because in North Italy, you could see that overrun hospital, that really was an issue because the infectious uh, uh, cluster actually was around the health system itself. Uh, secondly, we had a very high traditionally capacity of ICU beds. And thirdly, and that brings us to testing, traditionally, we have a broad network of labs. Um, so from the very beginning, we had more than 140 labs and big labs, actually, uh, all over the country doing the testing. The test was developed here in Berlin, around the corner in the Charité University Hospital. Um, and I remember very well that in a, a big country like the U.S., uh, for weeks, actually, there were only two or three points where the tests were done. So it took days, if not longer, till you got finally a result. And the tests were not paid uh, by the health system in the US at the very beginning for weeks. And so it was a question of money, for example, if you get the tests uh, uh, or not. Uh, and we had uh, the opportunity to really do the testing broadly from the beginning because of this lab infrastructure. And we decided very early that it is covered by the public health system uh, so that uh, any, everyone with symptoms or as a contact person had the chance to be to be tested. Uh, and we kept that one. Uh, yeah, we had a point where we were thinking, uh, like, uh, like you just mentioned, because there is our pandemic plans that say at one certain point, you, when it comes to mitigation, especially uh, the, that phase, you just um, uh, focus uh, on, on, on some certain uh, vulnerable groups to, to, to test. But we kept on testing. Uh, broadly. Uh, last week was actually 500,000 tests that were done, uh, the, the highest number uh, in the whole, uh, although we are down to uh, on less than one person was positive. So it's broadly tested still, uh, but somehow, uh, I mean, that was a conscious decision. But of course, back then, uh, uh, it, we, we didn't know yet what that meant actually for us to really see what's going in in the country and what difference that can make. Did you use uh, just government, uh, state and federal testing laboratories or did you go to universities and the private sector as well? Private. Uh, most of the labs are privately run, but they are part of our, uh, of our uh, network. And, you know, in, in Germany, um, uh, most doctors are, are self-employed and then they're 
as general practitioners or they are uh, uh, employed by the by the hospitals but that those hospitals are more or less uh, independently run as well not state hospitals um, and this lab network is one of of doctors um, um, but they they are part of the the public uh, treatment uh, uh, area and they have contracts with uh, public insurances so actually from from day one we had this big network of and they have very modern uh, 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 machines too which can do thousands of tests a day um, so actually we used uh, this this broad network from 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 day one actually so I, I just wonder if I could ask you, Jens, the, the bit that's puzzling me, um, sometimes it's said that the great strength of the German system is that you don't have top-down direction. We have a much more centralised system in the UK where uh, the state uh, owns and runs the hospitals as well as being responsible for public health policy. Um, did you sit down as health minister for Germany and say we are following a flu strategy, we're following a SARS strategy, or is this something that is the responsibility of the states? Well, I mean, first of all, the, uh, that is actually what I just said some days ago when we had another council meeting of the EU health ministers uh, and we were debating how much the EU should interfere into the national health systems. You remember <laughs> that was a debate we always had. Um, and actually, Britain and, and, and Germany were always on the same side of that deba debate, uh, uh, and still would be, I assume. Um, because, and I always make the point that uh, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the area of health, there should be national responsibility because there's a tradition and history that is always linked with the national health systems. And you're right, ours is in some areas very much different to the UK system. Uh, the NHS, uh, but both are linked just with the tradition of the countries uh, they have uh, developed over centuries, per, kind of. Um, and so these differences that, that uh, the NHS is very much centralized and most doctors are more or less employed by the state and, and that, that is just part of the DNA of, of Great Britain, I would say, as far as I understood it. Uh, and at the same time, the way uh, the German uh, social security system is organized with its kind of MISO uh, uh, system. Um, it's not a state system, but it's not a private system either. It's a kind of uh, 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 yeah, insurances that, that are companies, but not making a profit. Uh, so there's a framework for it and for a framework for doctors as well. It's not just free doctors billing whatever they want to. There's a clear regulation of what, what they can do and what not. So sometimes, you know, in the, in the, in the past years, I was a bit jealous uh, uh, because uh, I couldn't just do it from a central Berlin uh, ministry and just say, now we do this and now we do that. And then it is done in every hospital. It, it always takes much more time to get something implemented and you need to convince more uh, 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 theoretical uh, 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 opponents, uh, but uh, uh, on the other side, uh, these these um, responsibility that is then there on different levels gives strength at the same time. So you can argue that both has advantages and disadvantages. The federal system, by the way, as well. My French colleague always asked me, "How do you do this?" We just say in Paris how it has to go. Uh -huh. <laughs> then it's implemented all over the country and you have 16 federal states. And I said, yes, it takes sometimes some days longer till the federal government and the 16 prime ministers have the same approach in this crisis during the past months. But once we have the same approach, we have 16 different governments, uh, political responsible, responsible that really uh, uh, put together forces then, and then we can, make, can have a bigger impact. So I would say both has advantages and disadvantages, um, and in this crisis, uh, and the crisis always means there are unforeseen things, and the crisis always uh, means that, uh, that you have to handle things very pragmatic. I think in a crisis, it can be very helpful that you have many different players actually that are self-organized. Well, that's the puzzling thing, because I think most people would say in a crisis, that's when a centralized system will be better because, you know, the, the leader at the top can decide we're going to do this and everyone does it really quickly. But actually, the decentralized system in Germany have much better results. Now, you're, you're very diplomatic. 
um, which is one of your lovely qualities. But you've also got a reputation for being very direct speaking and plain speaking. So let me ask you the very direct question. If we were sitting down in a pub um, having a pint <laughs> and uh, I just said to you, come on Jens, why is it that you had so many fewer coronavirus deaths in Germany than we had in the UK? What would you tell me? Well, first of all, we are not sitting in a pub, Jeremy. <laughs> but uh, uh, besides, well, I, but I, I, I get this question often from, from other countries too, from the media and other, the US media or, uh, or from colleagues. And I, I find it really hard to answer because you see, I, I mean, we had our struggles too. We were struggling, for example, with, with getting enough masks. I remember very well how hard it was in February and March uh, for, for me and for us in, in, in the health system. In some areas, we just had, had, had luck, and in others, uh, we, yeah, we, we have a system that just worked well. But it's very hard for me from, from outside uh, to, 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 to say what went well or wrong in other countries. And actually, I would not <laughs> wait for others to do the same for Germany. Uh -huh. so, so I understand that I'm, 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 uh, I'm uh, and that is really uh, meant that way, seriously meant that way. I find it very hard um, uh, to, to do it from outside. But, but you, what I, I think what we really had is this chance, you know, when we, when we started the lockdown, which was a lockdown more a Swedish one than a Spanish one, which is not understood by all Germans. They found it very hard. But if you see what Spain had to do, mm. where, where military patrols were on the street and you only could leave the house for one hour or something, uh, and uh, compared to uh, the German situation, we were actually closer to the so-called Swedish way. Uh, but we had the lockdown uh, and we had it very early. Um, and back then, I remember very well, mid of March, numbers were still relatively down. I mean, mm. they were, but they were growing. And it's not a linear progression, as we know, with this virus. It's, uh, what is that in English? Exponential, exponentially. Uh, uh, and so we knew if we don't do something now, just within one week or two weeks, it could be too late because it happens quick. Uh, and, and we, I would say the difference, and you could see that in Spain, I remember very well when we sat down in Brussels, the French colleague, the Italian colleague, and me, and we were talking. Uh, and back then it was actually more or less Italy and France having uh, the problem. And the Spanish colleague, uh, 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 there were almost no cases yet. One week later, they had to start the shutdown because then it just, it just grew in, uh, exponentially. Uh, and that shows it was just a question of one, two, three weeks. If you, if you met the right time for, for lockdown or not, and, and to get the, the, the numbers, the curve down again or not, uh, how hard you have been hit or not. And, and that was more or less, I mean, we, we, we didn't know back then if, it, if this is the right time, if it is too early or mm. too late. Uh, but uh, somehow it seemed to be, have been the, the, just the right moment in, 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 in this, uh, in this uh, uh, spreading around of, of the virus to get it down before it really could spread. Now, Jens, um, there's uh, what we always talked about uh, when I was health secretary here was the issue of patient safety. And there's one area of patient safety where Germany performed very differently to the UK and with dramatically better results during the coronavirus crisis. And that is the safety of residents in care homes where you had uh, a death rate that was much less. In fact, some people say that uh, the precautions you took in care homes are more likely to be the reason than any other why Germany's death rate has been so much lower. And you didn't quite go as far as Hong Kong, which hasn't had a single death in a care home. But it's very noticeable, for example, that in the early stage of the crisis, when we discharged around 25,000 hospital patients into care homes without testing them, a lot of people have speculated that that may have been the reason that the virus spread into care homes. In Germany, you had a policy, and we heard about this on the Select Committee, where no care homes were allowed to take any hospital patients unless they could quarantine them for two weeks. 
Um, and then you introduce testing. But like us at the early stages, you didn't have that testing capability, but you said, if you don't have a test, you must have quarantine. So can you just talk to me about the approach you took to care homes as obviously a very high risk area for the spread of the virus and whether you think that had an important role to play in Germany's response? Well, um, first of all, what, what is important to see is uh, that uh, we were kind of lucky too that the first groups actually that were attacked or were, 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 uh, 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 had, had, uh, had the virus actually were infected were, were the Middle Ages. Why is that? Because it was those coming back from the skiing uh, holiday. Uh, you know, the famous Ischgl, the, 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 this village in, in Austria. So actually, our, our first outbreaks that we had, the first clusters we had, were among, among the 30s and 40s uh, years old. People my age, plus minus, that actually were, for, uh, were there for two weeks of skiing and came back. So actually, at the beginning, and that is different to some other countries, uh, uh, the, the, the group most affected was not the elderly. And that, again, gave us the chance to prepare um, uh, uh, better and, and longer. So uh, yes, you're right. And then we, uh, we had some uh, uh, big incidents, the Wolfsburg in the city of Wolfsburg and Würzburg, both, where um, uh, too many uh, uh, in, uh, inhabitants of, of such um, elderly care homes died because of an outbreak there. And you could see how brutal this virus is for these very old people that actually need, need, need care. Um, and then we immediately de decided to do it the way you, you just mentioned with this quarantine measures. But I have to say that was and still is very hard. Because, you know, for, for many of these, this social distancing we had put into place, no visitors at all, not even your, your partner. After we had situations, I remember well, and I talked to the people, 50 years of marriage, but they were not allowed to see each other then for days and weeks. So somehow this social distancing was a choice uh, between the devil and the deep blue sea for, 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 for us in this, because there's this social, uh, uh, the social consequences and, and then the, the health consequences that come with this distancing were hard too. And in the end, you need to balance between protecting and what harm it does to have the social distancing. Um, but we actually were very much on the side uh, to be very precautious uh, and actually have this quarantine and all these, uh, pre pre uh, uh, this, uh, this visitor uh, uh, prohibits uh, we, we put in place. Thank you. Um, and then the final question I wanted to ask you before we go for questions from the audience is about the risk of a second wave or a second surge in the virus. And obviously the big concern we all have is that, that this comes back around winter time when, when we, we perhaps have flu happening at the same time and uh, much more vulnerability in the health systems. Um, what are the measures that you're taking in Germany now to prepare against the second wave? Um, before, uh, before autumn and winter, what, what worries me right now these days about, I don't know if it is second wave or waves bigger or, or, or lower, but is, uh, is this uh, rise in mobility we just see all over Europe? We start traveling again, we have holiday time now. Uh, and as I just mentioned, Ischgl and the skiing holiday, uh, that really makes me not nervous, but uh, we have to be cautious, really cautious now. Uh, within Europe, I would say we are more or less all in the same situation after all the lockdowns that have taken place. But see, seeing for us in the European Union, the third country regime, whom to let in and whom not under which conditions, is very, very important to me to keep numbers down. And I see what's going on in the US and Latin America and other regions of the world. Uh, we really have to be restrictive for, for mobility uh, and exchange with these areas to, to keep numbers down in the upcoming weeks. So for this possible second uh, wave, no one can really predict what lies ahead. But, but what I'm sure of is uh, we're gonna see it come. 
It's not like a tsunami out of sudden, especially if we keep our test capacity. Is that actually where we just started uh, this conversation? Uh, you need to keep on testing uh, broadly with system, not just uh, some how testing, you need to do it systemically um, and regularly, uh, but you need to do it because then you can see very early uh, in the development if there is a wave coming or not. Uh, and secondly, we are, will be better prepared uh, than we were in February and March. Uh, I mentioned the testing capacities and that we have in increased. Uh, we are better prepared to to actually steer and organize our ICU capacities. You know, we postponed all elective operations for weeks. And that, of course, did harm to those patients that just didn't get their hip operation or whatever. Uh, and, and for the next time, we really learn to better know uh, uh, how, how, how to manage these ICU capacities regionally uh, with a digital reg register we put in place. Um, we will have treatments. I mean, remdesivir is not that big a uh, thing that people make out of it, but it's a relief uh, for some patients. We have other uh, treatments in place and drugs, so step by step, week by week, we know more. And we will do the biggest flu vaccine uh, uh, advert ever <laughs> in the history of Germany, I would say. We have uh, more than 26 doses available, uh, more than ever. Uh, so we try to get flu numbers down as good as possible to have not both uh, uh, corona and flu around at the same, uh, the same time. So we, and we will have masks enough. That's for sure. I have two billion now, uh, actually, uh, uh, stockpiled. Uh, so actually, we will, we will be better prepared. We will see it coming. I'm very convinced of that. Uh, 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 so whatever comes, uh, we, we will be, uh, yeah, we will manage it better. I'm, I'm, but the question is, will we manage it better in a European cooperation than we did last time? And I will do everything. You know, we have taken over the EU presidency 1st of July. We will do everything possible to have a better European answer this time. Well, Jens, thank you. It's been, it's been fascinating to talk to you again. And uh, it's reminded me of the tremendous collaboration we had when, uh, when I was a government minister. Um, but, uh, but I think we are all um, hugely admiring of the response that Germany has uh, done to the virus. And that's been a very interesting discussion. I'm gonna hand over to Juliet now, who's going to moderate with some questions from the audience. But thank you for a fascinating introduction. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you to Jeremy for asking those questions. Now I'm going to ask a quick first question to, uh, because I have the opportunity. Uh, and what I wanted to ask was how this scientific advice works for you, because over here uh, we have this large, quite unwieldy committee called SAGE, which has lots of advisors on it, but um, uh, has not performed that well through the crisis, seems to have been very slow to adapt from the flu strategy to a coronavirus strategy. So how does it work in terms of getting uh, the best scientific advice you can? Is it from within government? Do you, uh, did you seek out advice from outside government and how did that work? That's, that's a good question. It's, by the way, another strange of, of the whole of Europe, I would say, that we have this many universities and this many experts uh, all over. Um, um, actually, within the government, we do have the Robert Koch Institute, which is our CDC um, here, uh, and they are giving advice and expertise. They are part uh, of, of our uh, ministry, um, of course, but from the beginning, uh, uh, me, the chancellor, uh, or the whole government, actually, we, we, we did ask different experts um, for, for advice too. It was, it's not an official board or something. Uh, for example, this afternoon I have two or three video conferences with, with uh, experts on different issues. I try to put them together if, if it is about vaccination, if it is about uh, drugs, if it is about uh, second wave. So uh, we, it's very informal, more, more, more or less. What I find important is it's not only virologists, you know, there are two or one or two very famous ones. Uh, and that's all good because that was very helpful actually to explain to the public. I, I found it very helpful that there were experts in the media, in TV, in radio, podcasts, wherever, uh, that actually explained what's going on. 
Uh, I would say there was never a disease or a pandemic in which the people were so well informed uh, like this one. And, and of course, the experts helped. Uh, but it's very important. It's not just about the virus. It's about hygiene. It's about uh, uh, pneumologia. What is it in English? Uh, pneumologie. <laughs> you know, uh, and the lungs. Uh, it's about, uh, it's about um, 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 drug development. It's about vaccination. So I really try to biologists that have a different approach to a virus than, a, uh, than others. Um, uh, quite Darwin approach every now and then. But nevertheless, um, it's very important to me to have all these different experts uh, in, 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 these, in these rounds um, when, we, when we discuss and debate. And once I see a professor giving an interview that has an interesting approach or a different view, I actually call him immediately uh, and just try to get to go deeper into it and to understand. Uh, and uh, you know our our chancellor is is, uh, is a scientist too, uh, so she has the same same approach. And uh, in the end, it's politicians to decide. We are elected to, to to take the decision, and the decision always has to balance different views. It's not just a scientific view; it's a social impact, it's the economic impact. Um, but it's helpful for me, and it was and still is, to have this uh, experts advice officially through our institution. Uh, the Robert Koch Institute, uh, but informal uh, too, and I would say both played a big role in here. Great, thank you. Um, so we're now going to go to someone from the audience, and I think we have Tom Tugendhat. If uh, whoever's asking the question, please say your name and your affiliation or your official role before you ask your question. I think I'm right that we have Tom on the line. You do? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, Jens. It's, uh, it's great to be speaking to you again. My name is Tom Tugendhat. I'm chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and uh, but uh, to you, an old friend. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, if I may, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to push you a bit more about European cooperation, because one of the things that really struck me in the very early days of the crisis was the controls that were put on uh, medical supplies and movements within the Schengen Zone, within the European Union. And how other countries exploited it. And I'm thinking, of course, particularly of China uh, in the early days. And I was just wondering if you can tell me a little bit about what you think uh, the EU has learned from this now that you're in the presidential seat, how you are going to be ready uh, for the future. And I, I know two billion pieces of two billion masks is a hell of a, is a, hell of a stockpile. Mm -hmm. And how are you diversifying supply to make sure that we're not, or rather you're not, so dependent on a single source. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Good to hear you, not to see you, but to hear you. Uh, you again. look well anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, um, um, first of all, in general, I start with the borders um, and then I go to the medical uh, uh, medicines. Um, you know, I, I come from a, from a border region, uh, the Dutch, uh, German, German Dutch border. Um, we don't had to put measures in place there, but I remember very well that day when we decided to put into place again after many, many years, decades almost, um, uh, controls uh, and, and restrictions actually. It was not just controlling, we were pushing back people uh, at the French, uh, German, the Austrian, German, the Swiss, German border. Uh, and that decision was taken actually because, first of all, the two countries had different approaches back then. I remember very well that on short notice, we have to say, France really locked down, closed all the shops and restaurants. Uh, and then in, in, in Grand Est, in the east region of France and the border region to, to, to Saarland and Baden-Württemberg, to Germany, uh, we know one thing. If one country has a public holiday and the other one has open shops, all Germans go over to the and, and vice versa. So as soon as you, as you have a country uh, closing everything like France and Germany has still everything open, that just makes thousands of people moving for shopping for whatever. Uh, and at the same time, we had a big, big outbreak in Grand Est in this region very high incidences. So we said to protect actually. Uh, both sides, it is important um, uh, because we didn't want this mobility uh, uh, to have this border control. People for work, of course, could cross 
but it was very restrictive and it was hard. It was really families that couldn't see each other uh, for, for, for weeks. A lesson learned is really to limit it to the real necessary situation, uh, to the situations where it is really necessary to, to put this into, in, into place. But I would not say never again. It really depends on the situation uh, uh, and, and the development of, 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 uh, of this uh, uh, outbreak. Um, when it comes to medical uh, supplies, um, what I find important is because I just two days ago I was asked by the MEPs uh, uh, in a debate with the European Parliament why Germany ha has put in place uh, export restrictions for masks at the beginning. Um, and but it's important we did not forbid it. We did put, put into place restrictions that said you need to have a permission why? Actually, we allowed all exports to EU countries and European countries. But what we saw is that, especially masks and personal protective equipment, uh, with, with really with suits full of uh, suitcases full of, of money, uh, were bought and brought outside of uh, Europe, back to China, wherever. Um, and we asked for the European Union to take measures, and that took weeks. And we still saw what happened. And so we said, uh, then we take a, a national measure. Lesson learned is we need a, a quicker European uh, a response then. And Europe still has in place export restrictions as the European Union uh, regarding uh, personal protective equipment. Which brings me to the general and last point uh, of China and uh, dependence, being dependent actually. It should not be decided in. China, if we have protective, uh, protective masks for our nurses in Amsterdam, London, or, or Berlin, uh, it should be decided here in Europe. Um, and so well, we need to become less dependent in certain areas. I'm not questioning globalization at all in general uh, or, or free trade. I mean, we are one of the big winners of, 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 of globalization as an export nation. So of course we want uh, to keep free trade, but it's about the right degree of globalization in certain areas, critical areas like uh, APIs for, for drugs, um, like uh, medical masks. Uh, perhaps some other areas, uh, 5G is a uh, debate and, and other things where we sh need to be able in Europe uh, uh, to, 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 to supply ourselves uh, to become less dependent on China. And by the way, to become less dependent on China when it comes to selling products too. That the German and the European car manufacturing industry is so dependent on the market China is not good at all. We knew it before Corona, but we really have experienced it now uh, the hardest possible way. Um, and, and so a real lesson learned for me and for the European Union, and I think for, for Europe as a whole, including the UK is, we need to become less dependent on China in every regard, especially since China is really, uh, uh, I mean, it's not just a trading partner, it's, it's a merciless state to its own citizens. Thank you. Um, we have a question now from Kate Wilsey. Oh, hello there. Uh, my name is Aubrey Allegretti. I'm calling on behalf of Kate Wilsey. Uh, she's kindly signed us up from Sky News. Um, so thank you very much to both politicians. Um, I'd be interested to hear both of your answers uh, in response to this, if I may. Sky News uh, yesterday revealed that in the UK, Whitehall relied partially on handwritten tables. Ministers had to make frantic calls before the daily Downing Street news conferences to find the most up-to-date information. And an official told us, we will probably never know how many people have been tested for coronavirus. So to Mr. Hunt first, if you are able to answer this, are you worried there was a rush to roll out testing at the expense of accuracy and transparency? And what lessons can be learned from this experience? And to Mr. Spahn, how does that compare to Germany's experience of the testing regime? And what do you make of Boris Johnson's claim that no country in the world had a functioning contact tracing app? Thank you. Okay, I'll go first. Um, look, we were behind on testing um, and I think it's widely recognized we were wrong to stop it on March the 12th. Um, but then we had to do catch up and we had to do it very quickly. So I don't criticize Matt Hancock at all for the fact that we went at breakneck speed in April 
to get our testing capacity up to 100,000 a month. And I'm sure that there were lots of um, bumps in the road in that process. But the fact is, because he managed to get our capacity up to around 100,000 a month by the end of April, uh, we were able to move into test and trace, which is, you know, globally the process that worked the best. So I, I'm not surprised that there are stories of, of that. Um, what I would say is that the danger of big national targets is that they, they focus everyone's attention on the process and not the outcome. And so one of the things that happened as a result of that target was that um, everyone was madly trying to get the testing numbers up, um, but uh, sometimes the tests were taking much too long to come back. And that's why, um, you know, in a test and trace process, you really need to get the test results back in 24 hours, which, which we are now doing most of the time. But um, that was one of the unintended consequences. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, we had to increase testing capacities too, though we, we started with, with this big lab, uh, lab network. And it just was hard, hard stuff to do. I mean, I had, uh, I had many debates and calls with, with Matt uh, Hancock on this too. We, we are in this together. All, all health ministers all, on the world were, all governments and all in, in, in Europe, because, you know, it's like the mask situation. All countries at the same time wanted the same. They wanted to increase testing capacities. They wanted to have more uh, uh, medical masks. And if all countries try to buy the same at the same time uh, with limited uh, production capacities, uh, it, it just makes it hard for all of us and made it hard for all of us just to, 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 uh, uh, to increase in all these areas. Um, and I'm very much impressed what... Uh, uh, what uh, the UK, what Matt, man Matt managed to do actually. And uh, as I said, uh, we were all in this together. It was hard times for all of us and we all had struggling moments uh, because uh, I am not sure if ever, if ever in history, but uh, for sure ever in 100 years, we had the same demand for the same products of the whole world. Uh, and that makes it hard then. Um, when it comes to, uh, to the Corona warning app, I've seen it on, on Twitter. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Prime Minister's question time, I, I, I guess. Uh, I, I would say um, perhaps the, the Prime Minister made it too easy for the leader of the opposition uh, by asking that question. Um, but nevertheless, uh, my team and I, when we saw the scene, we were surprised and proud of it. I mean, because it was hard work to do. Uh, we were not sure when we started this um, project with this Corona warning app uh, if, if it really uh, works out the way we wanted it to, the data protection uh, 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 rules uh, that need to be applied, uh, 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 the Bluetooth technology for the first time. It's really uh, engineering work in there to make that, uh, uh, to make that happening, that what we have there, uh, that was far away from being easygoing. Uh, to, to have this app and now I'm happy that we have more than 50 million Germans that have downloaded it and it works very well and I'm happy uh, that uh, someone helped us to promote it. Thank you. Uh, we now go to Michael Hitz. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you very much for a very uh, thought, thoughtful presentation. Uh, my particular interest is in uh, my, my particular interest is in uh, infrastructure and resilience and to a certain extent supply chains, I guess, but, but can you talk a little bit more, can you use a little bit more colour around the, the way in which these labs are being developed? Why there is such, is it, why there is such a, a, a strong infrastructure in, in, in these labs? Because I, I would su suggest that it's not just the laboratories, there's a whole lot of other things going on in a more broad, broad, more broadly in uh, in, in the uh, in the fabric of uh, the industrial fabric of, of Germany that allows this to happen. Again, oh, sorry, so Michael, if you could just say your affiliation. For I'm sorry, I'm Michael Hinsey. I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm a CEO of uh, CQS and a long-term supporter of uh, policy exchange. Great, thanks. 
Um, well, actually, um, the German healthcare system was in a relatively good shape in, in general. Why well, is uh, because we have now more than 15 years of not cutting at all. The last big cut in, in health expenditures was in 2004. Uh, since then, we had, uh, even in, in these difficult times of the financial crisis, uh, we had uh, uh, not to cut. Uh, and, and that actually uh, g gave the whole system a, a very good base, a very good financial uh, a base too, and a good base when it comes to professions and professionals working in the system. And uh, in, in general, traditionally, we have this uh, broad, big uh, lab capacities privately run most of the labs um, because um, actually, yeah, there, there are many tests, not just on coronavirus, but uh, of course in many, many other areas um, um, that actually are done every day, every, every, every week. Uh, Germans like to be tested somehow, but it's important to test uh, um, to detect all kinds of diseases. Uh, and I would say, if, if this crisis shows something, by the way, at the beginning of this uh, decade is uh, that health, uh, personal health, and the question of testing will be one of the, that's my, I'm really convinced of this, one of the main driver uh, technology in, in technology and in economy too. Because with this little device here, with the mobile, uh, uh, and we will see devices, and we are, there are already some in place, where you can do most of the testing that is done now in all these labs, actually back home with just a, a little bit of your blood uh, or, or urine or whatever. Uh, and that will really change medicine, that will change our all day's life. Uh, we can know about ourselves and our body much more every morning and every evening if we want to, uh, uh, more than we ever knew. Uh, genomics and other things. So these these lab capacities we have, very modern equipped uh, with, with big machines actually that just developed over the past years with uh, the possibility and availability of getting tested in all different areas uh, covered by the public health system uh, and, and Germans and the doctors make, make use of it and that actually led to this infrastructure. Thank you. We'll now go to uh, Kishwa Faulkner. Hi. Um, my affiliation is, is the House of Lords, but it's also that I'm a member of the British Königswinter Committee. Uh, Mr. Jan, it's been a pleasure to welcome you there in Oxford a few years ago, and we were hoping to see you again this year at our anniversary celebrations, but that's been postponed. Um, Mr. Jan, I wanted to ask you about German domestic politics a little bit and the exciting nature of the race now for the chancellorship. Um, so I think I understand that you're backing Amin Laschet, but uh, we have an intriguing headline in today's Financial Times, which asks the question about whether a Bavarian can be chancellor these days. Of course, they're referring to the rise of Marcus Soda. So I wonder if you would say a little bit about how you think that race is coming through. And secondly, I wonder whether you could comment as a former finance minister on Germany's corporate governance. We've had Deutsche Bank, we've had Dieselgate, we've had Commerce Bank, now we have Wirecard. What is it about German corporate governance, perhaps too close to regulators, that makes it so, uh, well, that makes it go go wrong so frequently? Well, uh, that takes away, us away from coronaviruses, but nevertheless, uh, somehow the situation that you described, uh, uh, that what is described in the Financial Times, obviously, um, is connected uh, with this coronavirus uh, uh, and the situation, uh, the political situation that uh, follows. Um, you know, I remember very well the morning when Armin Laschet, the Prime Minister of North Rhine Westphalia, and me uh, announced that we will be uh, running as a team, him as a leader, I'm at the, as his uh, vice uh, chair um, uh, for, for leadership of the party. That was uh, a, a certain Tuesday morning uh, after Carnival in Germany, an important date in February. 
Uh, and I remember very well when I left stage there, I was uh, uh, entering in plane to Rome. I just mentioned that meeting in Rome of the health ministers uh, regarding the situation in North Italy. And then when I was coming back, entering my home, uh, still actually uh, uh, still the, the coat on, uh, the uh, health minister of North Rome Westphalia called me and said, listen Jens, we have a problem in Heinsberg. And Heinsberg was the first spot, the first big cluster of, of this outbreak we had. And I knew immediately, and the next morning I had to say in the news, we have a new situation, this epidemic has reached Germany um, because we can't trace the contacts anymore. Um, and just within 12 to 24 hours, all these political, party political issues, uh, all the debates we had before that, Thuringia, if you, if you might remember the situation with, uh, with the difficult uh, situation in that federal state, the infights within the party, uh, all this was just gone for me because I knew from that Wednesday on uh, for the upcoming weeks and months, uh, this virus, this pandemic uh, actually uh, needs my main focus and just I, I, I wasn't dealing with anything else since then. Um, and that counts for the whole political arena here in, in, in Germany and Europe, I would say, in the world. Um, so actually, I'm not yet back into this uh, race uh, uh, modus, mode. Uh, that party convention will be in December. That's still more days and months to go than actually the start of Corona in Germany uh, is, uh, is, is, is uh, back. And, and so actually, uh, I'm, I might tell you in some weeks or months uh, where it goes, uh, uh, but I would say today's political arena is, is just so much uh, uh, still determined by, by Corona that it does not give any clue what's going on in December. What I just see is that in times like this, people, it's like the financial crisis or the, the migration crisis or climate. Uh, in times like this, people rely on, on government, on the state. And I would say what, and that is something for my party and I would say for the race of the party top as well, because we need to tell a story why we want to govern uh, Germany for the next decade after 16 years of Angela Merkel, 16 years. Um, and that needs a good, a good explanation, good content, a good platform, actually, and not uh, and, and a good leader. Uh, and I'm very convinced that uh, the role of state, social state, state's role in the economy, the state as a strong state, a robust state, uh, that really has changed through this crisis. And that will determine many of the debates that uh, uh, will, will, will start after, after summer and the economic debate, especially when we see the real impact of this crisis on our economy and the labor market. Uh, so actually, it's really not yet the time, from my point of view, to have this party, internal party debates that has nothing to do with what citizens are really interested in. So I'm happy if the Financial Times covers it but it's not, uh, not yet my cup of tea. When it comes to uh, uh, corporate Germany, well, actually, now as you have put all these cases together, I haven't seen it yet that way, I have to admit, uh, and not in this row you just, uh, uh, you just uh, made out of it. Um, I need to think about it, if, if that has a point or not. I would say all these cases are, are, are very different and there's no interconnection in, in this general uh, notion you met. Is it a too, too close link between state and, and corporate? I would not say, I would not put it that way, but that's fruit for thought, I would say. I, can't, I could not give a clue answer now, a, a good answer now, if that has a connection all these cases or not. I have. <laughs> Frankly, I have not yet think about that, thought about that, but I will now. Thank you. It's uh, refreshing to hear politicians sometimes say they're not sure. So uh, and now we're going to go to David Goodhart. Hello. Yes, I um, I work here at Policy Exchange. Um, 
uh, used to be a foreign correspondent in Germany. We've met uh, a couple of times, Jens, in Berlin. Um, but I was a guest at your um, at a party of yours um, last year. Um, I wanted to go back to the tech, the um, sorry, the the app question, um, and just to stick up for Boris slightly on that question. I think your app had been up and running about three days when he made his statement, and it was not clear that it was really functioning properly at that point. But um, um, what the, the question I really want to ask is how we've seen the kind of dominoes fall all over Europe. Almost all countries have started with the idea of their own, their own app, with their own technology, quite centralised, governments in charge. And one by one, they have, they have accepted that they have to bow to the system that the tech platforms, I think it's Apple and Google, isn't it, have, been, have, have designed for them. Um, and this was true of Germany as well. I think you gave up more quickly than most other countries, um, perhaps because of the greater sensitivity about privacy in Germany. Um, but the same thing happened in France. I mean, it was kind of like dominoes all over Europe. All of the countries started off with their own plan and all have ended up accepting the, the tech platforms plan. Now, I just wonder whether that is, is a healthy thing for our democracies. Does it, it really does point up the enormous power of these organizations in our lives? Is that something we should be worried about? And a brief second question, um, you, were kind of, you were boasting about how the system is working in Germany. You said you've now got 50 million people have downloaded it, but that's not really the point, is it? The point is, have lots of people who may have, uh, you know, have, who have had contact with strangers, uh, have those strangers been contacted by the system and have they submitted to quarantine in significant numbers. I mean, can, can you tell us a bit more about whether the system is working in that most relevant way? Yes, uh, David, uh, I, I, I tried to explain that one. Uh, first of all, we have, uh, I mean, 50 million downloads. You might think you, that's not, I, I, I agree that that alone is not yet a hint if it is uh, well working or not but nevertheless 15 million downloads is more than all eu country all other eu countries together so at least we are happy with that number already uh, and uh, happy that it uh, just functions uh, uh, on, on 50 million uh, mobiles in a way of course there are some bugs but that will be uh, 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 that will be solved soon with all the updates it's like a normal app uh, but nevertheless it works um, it works uh, decentralized and voluntarily, as you just mentioned, and as it is actually uh, uh, the condition that is asked by many, many citizens, not just in Germany, but especially in Germany when it comes to data protection. Um, what we see is that we have several hundreds um, positive tested persons that already have used the app to inform the context of the past two weeks. What is new is, and the difference is, for contact tracing, you can inform those contacts and uh, ask them to get tested too. We offer them all the test, uh, free test, uh, that you would never remember of. I mean, if, if the in the analog world, uh, the officials, the health authorities are asking you, with whom have you been in a closer situation in the past two weeks. And of course, you do remember with whom you had uh, a supper in the past days or with whom you were in the same car driving, um, but you don't remember who was sitting next to you in the train or in the plane or on a demonstration. Uh, people you just don't know. Uh, but those people can be informed now through this technology. And you might say, well, some hundred, that's low number compared to 50 million. I do agree, but you have to see, we have three to 400 positive cases per day only in Germany. Uh, so right now we are at a very low level uh, in total numbers of infections per day. Uh, and it's better from my point of view to have this app started and get tested in real life in a situation with low numbers so that we can uh, even uh, improve it for, for whatever might, uh, might come. Um, the other thing is I totally agree with you that it is a problem that we are so depending on Apple and Google on this, uh, that they open up their API, that was the issue. It's not that they did the technique 
or the development or, or, or the, the, the coding or, or whatever, they just opened um, and, and they helped and supported, of course, uh, the, 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 everything around the API. But I'm kind of proud that German engineering uh, actually made it possible that these Bluetooth technology is working and that is totally new and I'm very convinced that this technology we see now there that is able to uh, to measure actually how close you are to someone else um, just by the intensity of the signal uh, that this will be seen in many many other apps to come for total different things I don't know uh, but that is something that was developed here in Germany that's German engineering and it was Apple and Google that learned a lot from German engineers in that process uh, so it's not just uh, uh, them uh, it's it's uh, uh, made in Germany's in it uh, in it too, uh, but it is a problem that we are so depending on these two U.S. Uh, uh, corporates um, um, when it comes to just to reach our own people. I mean, if I can't if I can't get onto the devices and the mobiles uh, uh, and the, the 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 software of Apple and Google, I just can't reach uh, the people. Uh, and that is obviously uh, uh, or, or offer them something like like this app, and and that is obviously a problem. But the only solution would be that we have European players uh, that play that role. Uh, I mean, the debate with you, who are why is just the same debate. I, I always say it's not the question if you take a Chinese company or not. The actual fundamental question is why do we not have a European company anymore that can do this. We used to be good in this, in uh, developing and producing such stuff like 5G. And now we don't have any company anymore that can do it. And that is actually the problem. Uh, and for that, uh, but that is really a different story, but if I might just one more minute. And for that, you need to change European uh, 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 antitrust laws, for example, that Siemens and Alstom were not able to merge from my point of view is really a problem that the the now we are we we, we all do national help uh, and support for all the flight companies air france uh, lufthansa all the others british airways i don't know if they get support too why is it not that we use this chance to have a european air company a big one that is uh, world league and able to compete with china and the us uh, banking you, someone just mentioned Deutsche Bank. The truth is, besides Switzerland and the UK, continental Europe has no bank that is really uh, competitive to the US and China banks. So actually, what we need from my perspective in Europe are different antitrust laws that make it possible to develop real European players uh, through merging to working together uh, that can uh, that can play World League, uh, and as long as we don't know that might not possible, we step by step we might become more dependent on all these big players. And I'm sure sooner or later it will not just be U.S. players like Apple and Google, it will be Chinese players, and we see it with Huawei already coming. Uh, Tencent, Alibaba, names we've never heard of, but very big companies in China, and I don't want to be dependent on. Uh, Apple, neither on Alibaba for different reasons, but actually I want a sovereign Europe. Thank you. Uh, I've been asked to squeeze in one more question, so uh, hopefully uh, we've all got time. Um, we're going to go to Chris Smith, if you could keep your question brief and um, maybe if the Minister, if you could keep your answer brief. Thank, thank you for squeezing me in. It's Chris Smith from The Times here. Um, I just wanted to pick up your point about you know, the inevitability of more cases, a second wave, and the crucial role of testing in dealing with that. Is it clear where that testing should be targeted? That's something we're wrestling with here. Should it be regular checks for, for health workers, as, as, as Jeremy's keen on? The government wants it for social care. He's looking at taxi drivers. Uh, other people are talking about employers giving regular checks to employees. Where is, where should these tests be targeted to, to prevent that second wave uh, and minimize it? 
Well, um, uh, first of all, um, it's, we test, of course, those people with symptoms and co contact persons of those who are positively tested. And then I find it important, and that is what we made possible, that it is covered by the public system, regular testing of the health system, nurses, doctors, those who are working in the health system, because the health system itself, if it is not done the right way, can be the main cluster of, of, of this whole uh, of this whole uh, pandemic, uh, as we have seen in some countries and in North Italy, for example. So the health system needs regular testing. I would say some certain areas like perhaps teachers or, or, or those working in kindergartens where our federal states do regular testing um, because they are responsible for schools. Um, we do it now in many federal states in batteries. You might know that we had one, two meanwhile, big outbreaks in a battery. Uh, back home in my district or around near to my district in Westphalia, Turnius it is called. Um, and we see that especially the working circumstances there, no fresh air, just uh, turnover air, or tur how do you say that, just air that is circulated all day. Um, uh, in, in such working conditions, you need regular testing too. So actually we, we have different areas where we focus on regular testing, but the main area from my point of view, and not just as a health minister, but to protect those who are actually the most uh, uh, at risk uh, is the health system itself and the elderly care system, uh, because there you have people that really can be hit very hard uh, by this virus. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that ends today's webinar. And uh, thank you very much to Jens Spahn and Jeremy Hunt um, for taking us through uh, Germany's response to the coronavirus crisis. And hopefully we will see you again in person at some point soon. So uh, thank, thank you. And yeah, uh, everyone have a good Friday. Bye-bye.